Good afternoon, everyone. We're really excited to have you join us for a Office of Child Care Initiative to support the emotional wellness of children um, in the early care and education field. We're really excited to have this particular webinar focused on infant and early childhood mental health consultation. We have a lot of uh, professionals who are willing to share information about their state initiatives and national initiatives. So we'll um, get started very quickly. My name is Laura Johns and I'm the project director of the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance. And we're really, again, very excited that everybody could join us. I would love to pass it over to Richard Gonzalez, who's the director um, of the Division of Interagency and Special Initiatives for the Office of Child Care. So we'd love to have some welcome, welcoming words from you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So greetings from ACF and the Office of Child Care. We're pleased that you could join us today. Um, hopefully many of you were able to join the kickoff presentation of this OCC initiative to improve the social emotional wellness of children. Um, and this initiative and these presentations that we've been having seem particularly important as we attempt to recover from this extended pandemic period of separation from what we all consider our normal daily routines and to recover from a time of increased stress, anxiety, fear, disruption, uncertainty, confusion, loss of control, and even loss of confidence. As schools, Head Start and child care centers and family child care homes attempt to reopen and or remain open, the adults working with children can expect a greater degree of uncertainty about how best to address children's challenging behaviors. As children and adults transition back, we can surely expect a need for more patience, more flexibility, more understanding, and more time to adjust and to focus on appropriate strategies and approaches to address the challenges that we face. This presentation is intended to identify uh, support um, and resources that are available to those adults who will be with children so that adults can help ease the children's transition from home back into their group environments and help children feel less stressed, less anxious, less fearful, and more accepted, appreciated, and confident. We hope you find this information useful uh, and to your efforts. And with that, I'm now going to pass the presentation back to Laura so we can get started. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Richard. So um, a couple of housekeeping items for you. We are taping this webinar and it will be posted along with the PowerPoint on the ECTAS website. And um, Sarah or one of my colleagues at ECQA will put that um, email address, that link, right into the chat box for you. So you'll be able to get these PowerPoint slides. And I will tell you that they are an amazing resource in and of themselves. So I hope you will um, go to the website and download those. Um, also, we're hoping that we can get questions from you. So please use the chat box. If you have questions during the presentation, we will do our best to answer your questions as we go. Um, but we can also get back in touch with you if we don't have time at the end of the webinar. So don't forget to use that chat box as you need to. So I would love to do a quick introduction of everybody on our panel. So um, first, um, Linda Del Mata, who is the Professional Development Coordinator for Infant and Early Childhood Maternal Health Consultation in Illinois. Um, Lauren Rabinovitz is um, from the Center of Excellence in, for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation. Thanks, Lauren, for joining us. Brandy Fox is joining us from Pennsylvania. She is the director of the cross-sector initiatives for the Pennsylvania Key. Um, Nikki Edge and Rachel Mc, uh, Mackin is here from um, the great state um, from, I'm sorry, I just missed my uh, cues on there, that they're gonna be talking about their initiatives um, in their state around infant early childhood mental health. Sorry, I had a brain freeze. So I will pass it on to our presentation um, the agenda for today is going to be focused on um, a quick welcome um, that Lauren will um, kind of help us set some context on social emotional wellness and why we're focused on this right now. And then we will move on to our state presentations. So we'll have state presentations and then questions. So please don't hesitate again to chat in that chat box with your questions and then we will uh, make sure that we address them as we go. 
So let's start with a poll question, Sarah, if you'll hit the next screen. Um, is your state, territory, or tribe currently implementing an infant early childhood mental health consultation um, support network for children and families and providers? We'll just quickly try to see if we can get some results there. So we do have um, plenty of, of states who are different, um, uh, different implementation stages around infant early childhood mental health consultation. So that really helps our speakers today really kind of ground themselves in their feedback to you. So let me quickly turn it over to Lauren. So we, oh, I think Linda's gonna start us off so she can uh, get us kicked off with our presentation. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, Linda Delamata from Illinois, and uh, we've been involved in infant mental health consultation for a very long time. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what is consultation, and then I will turn it over to Lauren from the Center of Excellence. So you heard Richard talk, about um, you know the pandemic and how it's impacting us. So we need to take a look at what's going on with the children and the babies related to this pandemic. So much has changed. Um, we know that things that might have been their normal are very different now. Uh, you know, people are wearing masks and p people are experiencing higher anxiety. Um, we see more depression. No one knows what the future holds, so there's some uncertainty. Um, kids are having to stay separate from people they may have had long-term relationships with. I can't go see my grandma. I can't be close to my neighbors because we're all needing to be safe. And at the same time, there's continued stressors stressors with financial instability, food instability, um, lots of things happening right now that may cause some very um, concerning things in relationships that children need. Um, and one of the things we know is that relationships are central to how babies and children learn and grow, especially in the birth to five age range. Um, babies and young children learn from their relationships with others. Everything they do, they have picked up from an adult in their life who's there supporting them. Um, and so the brain is developing. So many uh, important things happen during this time. Um, and so it needs to be done through relationships. So the importance of attachment and secure relationships is so, is so significant during this time. Let's take a look at what happens to the adults during the pandemic too. We are concerned, we are confused, we don't know what to do. Um, we're worried about health, we're worried about our children. We're trying to work and we don't know if our children are safe where they're going, if they're with us and we're watching them while we're doing our work. So many things are happening. And so the relationships that may have been so significant and may have been so important to those children are experiencing some um, trauma. And so that impacts the children that we work with. Um, and this is such an important time in their lives. And this is such an important um, support that um, we have in our child serving systems that we need to take a look at how we preserve those relationships. Um, I, I was talking with a mental health consultant a, a while ago who was um, working with a child care program. And they were uh, talking about a baby that was crying all the time. The, the, their soothing didn't work. The child couldn't self-soothe. And as they started this conversation, um, the mental health consultant said, well, so how old is this baby? Um, and the child care worker said, well, the baby is six months old. And she said, so that baby was born during the pandemic. What has that baby experienced during that time? So they thought about that. They talked through, um, you know, the emotions of the adults around that baby, the um, difficulties that everyone is experiencing, the, the hypervigilance that they have, the changes in their emotional regulations themselves. And the way you calm a baby many times is you calm yourself and then you connect with that baby. So they did a lot of work then on how do we do that? Let's talk about how we calm ourselves. Let's self-regulate so that we can help this young one. 
beca begin to self-regulate. And in order to do that type of thing, in order to support those relationships and help that, that change happen, mental health consultants are there and they work with the staff and they work with the adults in that child's life. So mental health consultation is really um, taking a, a mental mental health prepared adult um, who con connects with the people who support the babies and the young children. And they work in whatever setting they're, they're at uh, where children learn and grow. So they might be in um, the homes, they might be in um, child care centers, preschools, um, early intervention, um, Head Starts, and they might be wherever those children are, and they are connecting with the adults in that in those programs to help see how we can improve the social and emotional and behavioral development for children. Really, here are some of the things that we do when we are um, being a consultant and um, supporting the activities. Um, because this is an indirect service, we, we don't come in and sit down with the child and work with the child and then say, okay, he's ready to go now. Um, we work with the people who are there supporting that child. So we do reflective practice. Um, and we do that with the, with the supervisors, with the staff, with the team, with the home visitors. We're there to listen, to think through things together, um, to thicken that story, find out more about what's going on. And as we're thinking through these stories, then we come up with, as a team, as a group that works together, strategies that might support that child and support that child's family. Um, what's going to work? You know, we, your, your person who knows the most about that baby or that child are those who are closest to them. So the families, the uh, child care workers, the teachers, they know this child and your mental health consultant comes in and supports that whole process. And they bring with them the mental health lens. So together we think through this, we thicken that story, we come up with some strategies, and then we look at how do we put these strategies in place. So we come up with some implementation things and we try those things to see, is this gonna support this family? Is this gonna support this child? Will we see some changes? And then we go back and we, and we try it. After that, we listen and we try to figure out, did that work? Did that not work? What might we need to change? How can we support what's happening here? Because this is a, this is something that is so important right now. And if this worked, we're in good shape. We might need to tweak a few things, but maybe this wasn't um, successful. So let's think through that again. What else might be going on? So we can put in place strategies that have been carefully um, revised and try it again and come up with a way to support that child. So the other thing that consultants can do is um, they can uh, do some professional development related to topics that uh, may be coming up as, the, as um, a child care worker works with these children and their families or um, whomever is we're supporting. So we may have someone say, you know, I'm running into some some problems understanding um, maternal depression because I'm I'm seeing that and I'm concerned about the attachment that this baby has with their mom. So can you can you talk to us about what is maternal depression and what are some things we can do now? And when do we get to the point where we need to refer someone to outside services? Or can we talk about children who aren't sleeping? You know, um, this child never takes a nap. Can, you know, I, I need some assistance on what's happening here. And our focus is moving, moving to what's happening in that child's life, finding out that picture, finding out that story. There are many benefits to consultation. Um, and, and, you know, we know that we want to have um, and we want to help the social and emotional skills develop. And we want to help children who may be coming to our attention because they have some kind of uh, behavior that is um, making the people who work with them concerned. So it could be that they are, um, you know, one of the things I, I hear a lot about is this child is biting. Um, so let's figure out what's going on in that child's life. Let's talk about that together. Let's come up with some strategies. Um, and in, a, in the world right now, we know that um, 
preschool expulsions and suspensions have been a huge concern. Um, it, at, at recently, we um, were able to say that um, anyone who is in a um, program that supports children, um, we we know that they having a mental health consultant will help address those issues. So we're not looking at suspensions. We're not looking at expulsions because children who are suspended or expelled end up having a trajectory that is not real positive. And we want to change that and have that be a success for them. So we also know that one benefit is improving the relationships that happen. So I'll give you an example of um, one that we dealt with recently. Um, when the mental health consultant went to see um, a teacher in, a, in a, a preschool program, the teacher said, I want that child out of my program, that he's too disruptive, the other kids aren't getting my time, I can't handle what's happening here, and we need that child to leave. Um, and the mental health consultant said, wow, this sounds to me like this is pretty um, frustrating for you. And they sat down and they talked about everything that was going on. And as they walked through these, what's happening with that child? What do you see in the other children? What are your biggest concerns? Um, the issue that was really servicing was that the child was very anxious. And as the consultant has a relationship already with this um, uh, uh, preschool teacher, she also was very anxious. So when one person is anxious and the other person is anxious, they sometimes increase that anxiety in each other. So they worked with uh, together on um, that whole concept of how she could um, calm herself, how she could not react when this child is highly anxious, how she could help him uh, work on some soothing techniques. And together they were able to um, make some changes so that child was able to um, stay in that classroom. And the teacher also learned from that. So working on that child-adult relationship. Um, we also know that this is a tough job. This is especially a tough job right now while we are dealing with this pandemic and all of the other things happening in our world. And to have a place to walk through those through reflective consultation, to think through what's happening, to find a place to get the supports that you need. Um, and right now, that has increased almost everywhere. I wish we could provide a mental health consultant to everyone who works in an early childhood setting because that would help some of the stress, some of the burnout, the connection that the children need with adults, the relationships that help them grow and develop. What, what consultation is not is we don't come in and fix things. We are not coming in, taking a look at that child, giving you a prescription and walking out. Um, we, we are, it is an indirect service that works with the adults. Um, and it is all about promotion and prevention. If this child or this family requires a therapeutic intervention, then that is not mental health consultation. That is a referral outside to services somewhere else, somewhere else. Um, mental health consultants are masters prepared, um, in the field of mental health. Um, and, um, that is something that um, is, they, they bring with them, but they are not the ones to do the therapy. Um, and we are hoping that um, people understand um, that consultation is here to build the capacity of families and professionals and support the young uh, children's development, um, and that we find it in a variety of settings. You don't go to an office and sit down and talk about this child. Uh, what it is not is direct therapy. Uh, no one's giving a diagnosis and providing therapy. The focus is not completely on the family. We look at every interaction that child has around them. Um, and um, it is a not group therapy. Um, sometimes people will say to me, what's the difference be when you're sitting down and talking with staff? Are you doing their therapy? And I'm free to say, um, this is about the work that people do and things that interfere with that work and how to move them to a different place so that I can focus on my work. So we're not talking about your divorce and we're not talking about your deep-seated childhood issues. We are talking about what might come up that keeps you from um, making the connection you need with that child or with that family. Um, it is not training and technical assistance.
I want to uh, introduce you to Lauren uh, Rabinovitz from the uh, Center of Excellence, who's going to continue to talk about infant early childhood mental health consultation. Lauren? Thank you, Linda, so much. So I have about 10 minutes or maybe even less to cover some really big topics. We're going to talk about the consultation workforce, the evidence base, systems, and equity. So each of these topics alone, um, we could we could spend hours and hours on. So I apologize. I'm going to fly through some of this pretty quickly just so we can stay um, close to time. I really want you to have the opportunity to hear from our great state representatives today who have amazing programs that are going to be really inspirational to you all. Um, I will take the opportunity to chat just a little bit about the Center of Excellence and highlight some of uh, some of our resources as we go. And um, I'll say this a couple times throughout, but I'll say it again now. I'm really hoping that we have the opportunity to continue to engage through the Center of Excellence and our technical assistance that is available and our other resources. Um, so let's just talk a little bit here about the workforce. Linda did a really excellent job in explaining not only what it takes to be a mental health consultant, but what it takes to connect with others and why this work is so, so important. So what you see here on this screen, these four boxes, this is certainly a simplification of consultant, uh, of what we really need a consultant to have in order to do this incredibly complex work. So certainly needs to be somebody who has a master's degree in mental health, uh, ideally licensed or license eligible. Though the consultant is not providing therapy, as Linda said, this is a therapeutic service. We certainly want consultants to have at least two to three years experience as a mental health professional and ideally in the setting where they are providing consultation. If this is an individual that comes from a, a more traditional mental health clinical background, then certainly training and consultation is very, very important. Uh, specialized knowledge is clearly needed. This consultant needs to understand a wide range of topics, infant mental health, trauma, attachment, typical, atypical development, adult mental health, given that the work is truly with the adults. Um, you know, so that, that's some about the how of the work, then there's the what of the work. So this needs to be an individual that has very unique attributes and skills that allow him or her to do the work, such as an, abil an ability to embody the consultative stance, cultural sensitivity, and the like. So the COE has a great deal more information about this on our website. Um, we have lots of different training resources. We also have developed, I should say we've updated what was already a very extensive set of competencies and we just recently re-released a new set of competencies and have a consultant assessment that goes along with that. So I hope you take a minute to check those resources out. I think they can be really useful in, in guiding at any stage of program implementation. Um, I, I do want to state briefly that, that we at the Center of Excellence, we are well aware that there's a lack of individuals across the country that meet this definition, and we are working in lots of ways to try and address that. I uh, would be happy to talk about that more. However, given the, the delicate nuance of the work and, and you know, what you were hearing Linda describe, giving some great examples, these qualifications really are essential. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about the evidence base. Again, there is so much that could be said about this, um, but I am delighted to share with you today that we have two, uh, we have a brand new research and evaluation toolkit on our website, and it contains two precious resources. And I mean that these are precious resources. Uh, one is an annotated bibliography and the other is an evidence synthesis. Um, so we have really done all the fun work of going through the literature in great detail and highlighted the best research that is out there and then summarized it. Um, we've also provided some future directions for the research community because um, there's a lot of future directions. Uh, but simply stated, if I were to take all that evidence that is out there and just try and uh, to boil it down to a couple key points, and this is echoing a little bit of what Linda said, but I think it's important enough to say again, we know that consultation improves social emotional well-being for young children and their families. We also know that the consultees, for example, a teacher, 
they receive an increased ability to support those young children that are experiencing any kind of social emotional challenge. They feel better about their ability to support those kids. And finally, we know that there are programmatic, we can see really significant programmatic improvements, such as reduced teacher turnover, overall improved classroom climate, et cetera. Um, we know this information mainly from outcome studies, which examine usually pre and post assessment data. Uh, where we really need to turn our attention is what types of consultation work best and for whom. So we, that's where we really need to dig around and get more specific in our understanding to help programs tailor their consultation approach to match outcomes. So that's sort of the, the secret piece we have to get to next, and we are well on our way. So something really important to note, Linda said this, this was one of the first few things she said, that we consider mental health consultation a promotion and prevention strategy. So this inherently makes it very important to consider how mental health consultation fits within a systems framework. So on the slide, you see some core components of, a, of thinking about consultation within a system context. These, these components are likely very consistent with, with other systems work that you have seen, um, but super important to consider. I would say that the most successful consultation programs, and you're gonna hear from two of them today, have done a great job situating their program in a wider early childhood system of care. And I bring up the term system of care intentionally because um, I want to segue quickly to the last bullet on this slide about families and caregivers. So many of you are likely familiar with system of care work, and it's important to remember some of the, the lessons learned from the early childhood systems of care that, that frankly had a lot of extra challenges in thinking about how to provide support to very young children with, with social and emotional challenges and their families. Um, I want to highlight a brand new resource that the Center of Excellence just developed in partnership with Fredla, the family-run executive director leadership organization, to help caregivers and programs better understand, to, to help programs have a resource to give to caregivers to help them better understand consultation. Um, it was shared with you in your resources. We have made one quick, um, one very small tweak to it since we sent it to you, um, but the newest version will be on our website. And, and it is it is okay to disseminate as it is. Now we, we changed one of the words on um, parents to caregivers that we had missed. And again, I am, I am really sorry for flying through these really important topics so quickly, but again, looking forward to having more time to chat through. Um, so equity, there is so, so much that we can say about mental health consultation and equity. We could spend days and days, but with the limited time that I have today, I want to say that we have some incredibly exciting new research on consultation and equity. You know, we've known for a long time that consultation reduces disproportionate suspension and expulsion for young children of color. But we've still, and to, to this day, we, we remain a little bit unsure exactly why. We have a lot of ideas, but we don't have quite enough evidence to fully back it up. So a lot of research is focusing on the role of bias, both implicit and explicit. So I want to mention um, some exciting work that comes out of Arizona, out of the Smart Support Program, where research was conducted with consultants to learn more about how the consultation helps, and this is one of my very favorite terms, helps to be a disruptor of bias. So in summarizing greatly, uh, consultants were asked about why they think consultation helps to address implicit bias, and you can see some of the um, answers on your screen here. And again, we can um, get you connected with those researchers if you want to learn even more about that. Uh, so I want to also just zoom out a teeny bit more while we're thinking about equity um, and mention a framework that was created to try and capture the mechanism whereby consultation affects implicit bias in early childhood education settings. So again, we know that consultation has the impact, but we still are trying to understand why. So this research maps really nicely onto what I was just talking about uh, previously, but, but goes a little uh, in a slightly different direction and looks at the core elements of consultation and how they, they match interventions 
that were designed for for in, for helping providers address their implicit bias. So simply speaking, this framework suggests that the relationship formed between the consultant and the consultee supports a foundation where strategies can be tried that may be impacting behavioral challenges. As those behavioral challenges subside, the consultee, maybe the teacher, theoretically is changing his or her individual thoughts and increasing their reflective capacity. So after we have those shifts, disciplinary, dis we, we expect to see changes in disciplinary decisions that will be less influenced by implicit bias and therefore disproportionality in exclusions and expulsion rates could decrease. So while mental health consultation was not exactly developed just to be an intervention that decreases or, or, or helps someone be more aware of their implicit bias, we are seeing that that is something that it can do. So these are just two studies that I wanted to highlight for you. They offer a nice glimpse into this incredibly exciting, incredibly important world about mental health consultation and equity. Um, there's a lot more about this coming. Our center also has uh, offered a series of equity webinars and follow-up webinar chats. And there's lots of information about that available on our website. And I would encourage you to, to check those out if you have not already. Um, so I knew I would be out of time um, by the time we got to this slide. So please, please, please do visit our Center of Excellence website and get in touch. You have um, the website address on this slide. You also have the email address that gets to us. You know, we as the, the National Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Child Mental Health Consultation, um, in the second phase, we've been able to build on all the fantastic work that was started in the first Center of Excellence. And we are here to provide technical assistance to programs that are in any stage of program design and implementation, even those that are yet to become a program. Um, we are also really, really excited to offer a number of online training resources. I believe I said that at the beginning. So please take a look, see what we have available, and um, let us know how we can be helpful. So I am excited now to turn this over to Brandy Fox in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and to share a little information about our um, Pennsylvania consultation model. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I'll probably skim through them, but you'll be able to access them and you can always contact me with any questions. But just to give you a sense, we're in our 15th year right now of um, implementing early childhood mental health consultation. We did start in 2006, primarily as a result of the Build Infant Toddler Task Force recommendations that were really calling on um, Pennsylvania and other states to um, communicate and build capacity around supporting social emotional development in young children, as well as increase our efforts um, in connecting infants and toddlers and their families to needed supports. So this just gives you a glimpse of our historic expansion, historical expansion of ECMH consultation. You know, in 2006, we started with 3.5 full-time staff. And as of 2019, we are at 26 uh, full-time consultants um, in the field. We did um, make a huge systems change in the beginning in, in, I guess, July of 2019, where we moved from a regional contract um, framework to a single employer. Um, that allowed us to save some money, hire more staff. We merged our infant um, early childhood mental health consultants and our infant toddler technical assistants into the program, created a single point of referral. Um, we were aiming for a more equitable distribution of services across the Commonwealth. Um, and we also were able to fund reflective supervision groups for all staff on the, on the project. You will see on the slide the breakdown of the staff, but also I threw in kind of staff degree attainment and their degree content area. You know, Pennsylvania has really um, been supportive globally in alternative pathways to early childhood mental health or early childhood systems workforce, and that includes our mental health consultants. So um, we do have a handful of individuals who have bachelor's degrees, but they also have infant mental health certificates, and we're working to have all of our staff obtain their infant mental health or early childhood mental health endorsement. I also want to point out that we feel um, really strongly about the collaborative nature of having um, professionals who have a mental health background or a human services background with those who have been in the classroom 
And so it's a very nice way to play off each other's strengths and, and create a cohesive and collaborative team. All of our staff members work out of a home office so that we can regionally, um, they're all kind of regionally placed across the state as you'll see on this map. Um, we assign cases within a two hour diameter of their home office. And this map also allows us to, to map this onto our request for services to figure out if we have an open position, do we need to hire in a different geographic location of Pennsylvania? Oh, go back one. Um, one thing they wanted us to share was a little bit about how we're funded. So you'll see on this slide that we are primarily funded through um, child care development block grant dollars, a little bit of IDEA, and a little bit of our state funded pre-K -pre services. So that is how we're funded. Um, historically, it's always been blended. It's been sustained over the 15 years. Um, and just to let you know, we do not, our, our consultants do not go into Head Start early Head Start or migrant Head Start locations because of that um, duplication of service. But we do work very closely with our Head Start collab director on ways that we can collaborate, share professional development opportunities, um, work with each other to enhance our, our consultation approach. Our goals really are centered around reducing expulsion suspension practices, increasing so, uh, you know, early care and education and families' uh, capacities around supporting social emotional development and linking and bridging systems on behalf of young children and families. We are um, a child, child specific, child focused approach in our, our consultation efforts. We're called or were requested by programs who are serving children birth to five and maybe struggling with puzzling development or challenging behaviors with those children. We do require uh, parent permission in order to come into the classroom on behalf of a child. Typically, our consultants are probably in a program about 10 times. We do serve center-based, uh, family-based, and uh, group-based care. And we really try to focus and hone in our consultation around those adults who are in relationship with children. And not only are we supporting you know, those relationships between a single child and their caregiver, we're also keeping in mind the context of that entire classroom and the needs of that entire class and all the children. We do ground ourselves in the pyramid model um, because we think those are really great scientifically anchored practices that make sense for early childhood educators. Um, we're not pyramid model coaches, but we definitely um, use those practices um, to give education or ed educators, you know, a sense of what they can do to support social emotional development and prevent challenging behaviors, how to embed some of those routines into those environments, um, and then thinking about skill building and even individualized attention for a child who's really, really struggling. But I do wanna say that we work really hard to tie pyramid model practices to infant early childhood mental health theory, to trauma-informed practices, to uh, child development trajectories, and also reflect practice and strength-based approaches. So for example, if we're thinking about attachment and early relational health, we know that all those practices associated with nurturing and responsive relationships reinforce attachment and relational health. So there is a definite connection between some of those hands-on practices you can do every day and, and the theory and what it reinforces um, on the back end, I guess. Um, we have been able to sustain and expand our program through robust data collection and evaluation strategies. And so the next several slides are really um, to give you a snapshot of what we collect and how it's really supported our, um, our expansion efforts and our reach. So since the pilot year, we have um, received over 5,000 requests for consultation services. And when we think of the classroom focus, a child and a classroom focus, if you look at our, you know, if a classroom has between eight and 15 children, you know, we're looking at, at um, it, those impact numbers for children zero to five, and also then thinking about two to three educators in those classrooms. All of this consultation is impacting all of those individuals' experiences and building capacity. 
we collect things such as age of the child at time of request, um, the, the gender of the child um, at time of request. You'll see that the largest uh, category is children 37 to 60 months, which makes perfect sense because that's when children have a little bit more overt challenging behaviors in a classroom. Um, and then the other portion is, is um, our infants and toddlers. Um, we did just start collecting whether or not children were receiving any kind of childcare subsidy or support. So you'll see about 66% of the children are not receiving subsidy. And then the other parts of that pie chart give a, give a breakdown of childcare subsidy, state funded pre-K, and um, in the county of Philadelphia or the city of Philadelphia, the mayor has invested um, subs their own subsidy funds to help families pay for high quality childcare. So we are working with them to capture that information. We also, um, as a result of an external evaluation with Georgetown and Deb Perry and Annie Davis, um, we started to uh, work on collecting race and ethnicity of children who are being served in ICMH. So you'll see this, this chart here. Um, it worries me a little bit, but then I kind of looked at our PA census data and it says, you know, children zero to four, it's about 65% are white. So we're kind of in line with our census data, but we'd still like to see um, an expansion of, of serving more families and children. We do collect, you know, who in our quality rating um, improvement system are, is requesting early childhood mental health consultation. Uh, typically we reach about 360 unduplicated facilities in about 47 out of 67 counties in Pennsylvania. So we, we like to keep an eye on this. We often reflect a lot around um, why, do, why are our highest quality um, early learning programs requesting consultation? And we think oftentimes it might be because um, they know the service is available and they know they've tried everything possible in their toolbox um, and then they request that. So we're often looking to diversify the um, programs that we're serving. Uh, we, we collect whether or not they have early intervention before consultation starts. And then the next few slides that I'll just move quickly through so Nikki has time to talk um, are really about a glimpse, the glimpse of some of the pre and post consultation measures we use to illustrate program impact. Like I said, having a robust ability to demonstrate effectiveness is going to help uh, create and sustain the program over time. So we look at whether or not the um, teacher's perception of difficulties and challenging behaviors has reduced post-consultation. We look at whether or not the educator stress has reduced as a result of consultation by using the child care worker job stress inventory. And then we also use both the teapot and the tippy toes pre and post consultation to demonstrate whether or not a teacher's uh, pyramid model practices have increased ever as a result of consultation. We track um, what referrals our consultants are making to other systems partners so that we can use this data to inform those partners, to think about gaps and accessibility of, of those services, particularly um, relationship focused services for the zero to five population. And we do track expulsion risk um, in these three buckets, kind of positive, negative, and neutral. Negative is gonna be our expulsion rate, which has sat at about four to 6% annually. Um, what we are recognizing is that the neutral bucket more than likely has a lot of soft expulsions and suspensions, and we're trying to figure out the best way that we can start to tease those out a little bit. As you may be aware, there's a lot of barriers and opportunities. If you know Pennsylvania, you know that we are geographically very large. Um, and this is just a picture from 2016 that kind of shows the facilities that we were in across the state. So you can see a high density of programs in those different uh, metropolis areas. Oh, I went the wrong way. Um, we also started, be because we started getting a, a waiting list of about 100 programs per month because we didn't have a lot of staff, we noticed that there was a pattern of cases when we were able, when we were ready to apply a consultant to a program, those cases had closed. So we started to track why did they close? And you'll see the gray slice on this is saying 18% of those programs that were waiting for consultations to start 
had expelled those children. So we're using this data to try to figure out how do we partner programs with other services like pyramid model, coaching or facilitation or our quality coaches in the interim to um, our consultants being available. And then just to let you know, we had some recent uh, CQI efforts around expanding staffing. We're using the preschool expulsion risk measure in the very beginning to kind of see where, where um, students are falling on that measure. We're working on a universal tier of consultation um, to really look at program and classrooms. All my consultants were recently um, trained on the climate of healthy interactions for learning and development. And then we've done a lot of pivoting around consultation, uh, teleconsultation, and kind of larger swaths of allowing for some holding space for, for the, um, the stressful time that programs are in. And just uh, the last slide is just around public awareness. Um, historically, we just did a lot of word of mouth through Octel Regional Partners. Um, and what you find is that increased promotion can have consequences, both negative um, and positive. You know, there's always the demand versus supply issue. Um, we know that a wait list equals a lot of increased staff anxiety um, for my own team, and so trying to manage that. But we also know that demand and waiting lists can also mean increased support for expansion, which is what we have experienced in the last two years. So that's a little bit about Pennsylvania. I'm always available for questions, but I'm gonna kick it over to Nikki and Rachel from Arkansas. Ah, yeah. We tricked you, Brandy. You're gonna kick it over to me because there are a couple of questions I'm hoping- I'm gonna kick it over to you. Okay. <laughs> so Brandy, um, number one, you sped through a lot and you had so many great resources. So um, thank you for that. Um, Three questions. I think one is a little bit longer answer that you might defer to and we put it something in writing. Um, the first one is about informed consent for caregivers um, and um, and how you deal with um, confidentiality um, statements and, and, and um, signed consent. So I'll let you address that sure. first. Um, Anna, I could I can put a, a link in the, in the chat box to our website, but we have what's called a parent facility agreement. And so both the parent and the facility agree to the provision of um, ECMH consultation. Either party can approach us for these services. And in that um, parent facility agreement, it kind of lays out some roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It lays out that we collect data, it's de-identified, that we don't share or talk to anyone without the parent's permission. So we would get um, releases of information if early intervention was involved or if mental health were involved. So we really try to um, protect the confidentiality of, of families who are agreeing to allow someone to come in to support their child and the program. Perfect. And then um, two other questions came in. Are you doing teapot and tippy toes now during the pandemic or is that something that was pre-pandemic? So we use the teapot and tippy toe short versions that are in um, the observation toolkit from the uh, Center for Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation. And we really, uh, we haven't figured that out yet. I think we're trying, but it's really hard to do virtual observations. So we are still in this trying to figure out how to do early childhood mental health consultation uh, virtually. So I will keep you posted if we figure that out. Yeah. I think that's something everyone's um, working for. We could have our, our own community of practice just on that topic. Yes. Um, and the last question was about frequency. Um, how often are consultants in programs and how long they typically stay in programs? Sure, so I actually have an evaluation that I'm looking at um, where they were looking at kind of context and duration. Um, our consultants try to be top heavy in the very beginning and have longer observations and more frequent visits, maybe you know three or four hour observation every couple of weeks. And as the consultation and action plan strategies begin to be implemented, they kind of reduce their contacts because they're picking up other cases. So, you know, I gave that average of 10 contacts, um, you know, and it really depends on the need of the program and the and the puzzling and challenging nature of, of the issue that's being presented. Great. Thank you. And again, as people are in the chat box and asking questions, if you're thinking that you want to try to have some peer to peer um, conversations um, with Brandy, um, Put that in the chat box and we will monitor that because we can always support peer-to-peer -peer conversations as part of technical assistance to your team. So thank you a lot for that. 
So I'm going to pass this over to Nikki and Rachel from the great state of Arkansas and let you guys uh, talk about your initiative. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, so excited to hear what Brandy has to say and to draw some real parallels between their experience and ours. I saw a lot of similarities in there. Um, so there'll be a couple places that we'll be able to skip some slides by saying what, what Brandy said. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk, Rachel and I are going to talk um, a little bit about our experience in Arkansas. I'm Nikki Edge, and um, I'm a professor at the med school, the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Um, and one of the roles that I play there is as um, director of our education program, which is called Project Play. And I'll let Rachel introduce her herself in a, in a minute, but we are close colleagues and she works in the in DHS in the office of our funder. Let's see. I can advance the slides here. There we go. Um, so I want to tell um, a little bit about our journey with mental health consultation in Arkansas. So uh, when we started about 18 years ago, um, thinking about mental health consultation, we didn't even know to call it that. Um, we just knew that we wanted to find some new ways to bring social emotional supports into classrooms. And we knew we wanted to do that through partnering childcare programs with um, mental health professionals. And so you'll hear as I talk about kind of our journey, where we've been, where we are now, that our approach is just extremely pragmatic. We do not have unlimited resources for mental health consultation. So we're always asking ourselves, how can we make the most of what we have? How can we take the, the resources that we have and get them to the children who will benefit the most? And the, the how we make those decisions, the answer to, to who would benefit the most has changed over time for us. Um, we've had changing context, changing partners, and so, I'll highlight a little bit of that evolution, talking about what our approach um, has been, what it is now. So you see on the um, slide a little bit about um, Project Play and our goals. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking in this presentation about what we do, because I think Linda and Brandy have described it so beautifully, and that, that really is the heart of what we do. Um, so our consultants are always working toward these goals but as you'll, as you'll see, some of these goals have taken sort of greater visibility or prominence in our work as, um, as our uh, program has evolved over time. Um, you'll hear from Rachel um, how we're very involved in expulsion prevention efforts in Arkansas. So that particular goal that we have has taken on some greater visibility in our work recently. But these are things, um, all these goals are things that we work on all the time. So I'll say a little bit about our partners and staffing. Um, our consultation program is operated out of our university here, but we're staffed primarily, not, not completely, but primarily through partnerships with our community mental health center, so our public mental health system. And we love that staffing model because it, it draws on the advantages of having people kind of that really know their community and are embedded in their community and have the full access to the, to the resources there in their mental health center. Um, our services are provided by mental health professionals that uh, become certified as a consultant to child care. And so this is, the way that this works is that um, you uh, saw Lauren talk about the wide range of knowledge and skills that a consultant needs. And we don't have a long and robust infant mental health tradition here in Arkansas. I, I don't hire people that, um, you know, that hold a Michigan endorsement. That's not how it works here. And so we take people with the, you know, greatest number of, of attributes um, and skills and knowledge that we can find, and then we supplement that. So we do a lot more front end training before we kind of release someone into the work of consultation than, than you might find in other programs. And then they do about a year of work putting together um, a, a, a portfolio, mentoring, shadowing, supervised experience, documenting their work, and that um, kind of accumulates in a, in a state level certificate um, as a consultant to childcare. And I also just wanna mention that because of our partners, um, including our funding partner being, being housed in DHS, we have had such wonderful opportunities to do system level consultation, to talk about how our systems support young children and their mental health. And that's been a wonderful and fun part of our work. 
So speaking of DHS, um, our, our Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education, which Rachel is here representing today, has been long the champion of this work in Arkansas. They have taken the lead in um, funding this from the very beginning, but working in close collaboration with their sister agencies in behavioral health and child welfare. Um, so we started in 2004 with tiny little regional pilots. Um, our growth graphic uh, looks a lot like Brandy's um, in terms of slow growth across years. They were not quite as big as, as her program. And um, we did a strong evaluation and we just learned what was working in these regions, what was working in these communities, and then kind of combined that with the emerging kind of national consensus um, that, we, that we heard of from um, Linda today about what consultation is and isn't and how it can look. And so then we took all that information and by 2011, we were able to say, okay, this is what we want our state model to look like. And we relaunched under the name of Project Play. Um, and then our work, as you'll hear, morphed again as we um, kind of put our consultation program in service of our expulsion prevention system. But I'll um, step a little bit back in time and, um, and talk about a little bit of our history providing programmatic and classroom consultation um, in, in those years uh, between 2011 and 2016. So as I've mentioned, um, the way our evolution has been driven was, was by asking ourselves the question, how do we use our limited resources to be most impactful for the kids that need us the most? And so in our early years, collectively as a team and as a state, we made the choice that the biggest kind of um, bang for our buck that we, could, that we could get would be to focus on supporting whole programs and, and who those programs would be would be driven um, by who needed us the most. And we defined that in partnership with our child welfare system as saying, let's identify those childcare programs where foster children are naturally clustering. And let's give those programs priority for our services. We were a tiny program and we, we wanted to serve kind of those, those um, children that we, that we knew were most vulnerable and needed us the most. And so we provided that consultation um, in the form of weekly visits and, and a six month partnership. And um, our, again, uh, that looked a lot like what you've heard of from, from Linda and, and from Brandy. And we, um, again, had a robust evaluation and we were able to send research assistants into these classrooms uh, before and after the six months and saw really positive changes in teacher-child interactions and in the mental health climate of the classroom. And so we were rocking along with that um, when our state took on an enormous new effort to uh, limit suspensions and expulsions. And so it felt very important to us as a consultation team that we join in that work from the very beginning, that we embrace that planning process um, and as, as that unfolded and evolved, it became clear we would need to refocus our efforts. Um, our consultation work would need to change a little bit to be able to support that initiative. And so Rachel is gonna tell you kind of more about how that came about and what that system looks like as a whole. And then I'll jump back in to talk a little bit about our role um, as the consultation team as part of that bigger initiative. So Rachel, it's yours. All right, let's see, so going to the next slide. Keep hitting next, and I don't think it's flipping to the next one for me. Yeah, let me see if I can flip for you. Yes, because for some reason when I hit the button, it is not wanting to flip it for me. There it goes. So Arkansas, and this was right around the time I started with the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education. I've been with them for about six years now. I am, my name is Rachel Machen, and I am a project manager in the Family Support Unit. And that is the unit that disseminates the um, CCDF funding and works directly with Arkansas's families. So we were influenced by the federal guidance on the prevention of suspension and expulsion and Arkansas jumped in and immediately said, okay, we've got to do something about this. Um, what, what can that be? So we created the suspension and expulsion work group, which was both internal and external partners, which included project play, 
and our other sister divisions within DHS, as well as our major university partners um, and other collaborative partners in early childhood education around the state of Arkansas. And they held their first meeting on January 7th of 2015. All right, next. And, of the, and out of those meetings came our policy changes. The Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education took a zero tolerance stance on the suspension and expulsion of children. And that started with adding to our CCDF participant agreement, no child shall be expelled without the permission from the without permission from the DCCECE. And this policy is in alignment with the suspension and expulsion policies in the Head Start, Early Head Start, and our state funded preschool program uh, regulations. Additionally, our licensing team has strongly discouraged suspension and expulsion in their, regu in their regulations. All of this together created this collective messaging. It is not okay to suspend and expel children. And that should not change based on their funding source. The DCCC, along with our behavior help uh, collaborative partners, take the stance that changing your disciplinary policy based on funding source is discriminatory. So all of that kind of came around with that message to create behavior help in 2016. You'll see here a graphic of an overview and we'll go through what the different tiers mean here in a minute. But effectively, a, any program in the state of Arkansas, any person in the state of Arkansas can refer a child to our system as long as that child is attending a licensed child care facility. That can be a family home, Head Start, Early Head Start, um, state funded preschool program, or an early care and education center. Once that referral comes into us, we will interview it at the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education, triage it, and assign it to one of our tiers. And we'll talk about the tiers in a little bit more, more depth here in a minute. Next. So like I mentioned just a moment ago, our target audience, any person in the state of Arkansas can refer any child who is in a program that is licensed. However, we do recognize that we, we have our limitations. If we're reaching capacity or we have more referrals than, than what we have manpower to staff, the cases will be assigned and triaged based on the severity of the situation as well as their funding source. Our program focuses on changing adult mindsets. Our consultants uh, don't walk into classrooms assuming that children are the issue. We work to focus um, on how we can help the adults best support the children in their current setting to keep the child in their current setting. Additionally, all funded providers are trained on behavior health and how to submit a referral. So this is something we have communication with on our funded providers. Next. Okay. Here is a snapshot of our website and the big orange button that means help is on the way. <laughs> So when you go to behaviorhelponline.org and you hit that big button, it will ask you a series of questions and you'll be able to submit that referral. And then it will go to, next. Those of us here at the division, the behavior help specialist. I started off as an interviewer for the division right around the time behavior help was first formed. And so we at the division will call these providers who have reached out to us for assistance and ask them a series of questions. What are you observing in the classroom? Have you tried anything that has worked? What have you tried that didn't work? You know, what, what's your training background? Um, have you involved any other agencies? And things of that nature so we can best gauge where they are on, on the spectrum of both frustration and severity and where they are in terms of capacity to support the child. If we determine that this case is not high frustration, the behaviors are typically developing, um, and it could benefit from possibly a wait and see approach, then we'll keep it and assign it to ourselves. So that's tier one. And maybe we'll give them a call in a week or two weeks, check in, hey, how's it going? Or we can offer online resources such as Naptime Academy or some webinars and say, why don't you guys try and, um, and and check this out and then we'll get back with you in a week or two and see how things are going. So that would be if it was triage to tier one. All right, next. Let's 
before we get into tier two and tier three, I think it's important to tell you guys that uh, the vast majority of our cases, 66%, are triaged to tier two, which is our technical assistance tier, with the remaining roughly 30, 34% going to early childhood mental health consultation. So when looking at behavioral health as a system, it is both of those working together. Tier two is our technical assistance. It, it's offered by A-State Childhood Services through Arkansas State University. It is a classroom change model focused on techniques that will benefit all children in the classroom. And it's provided by professionals with experience in developmentally appropriate practice and social emotional development. These tend to be flexible and short term between two and 10 visits, but can go longer than that if need be. And this focus is primarily on building the skills of the teacher and creating a more supportive classroom visual schedules, um, rearranging classroom furniture, looking at and analyzing materials and things like that. Now I'm gonna kick it back to Nikki for a minute because she is going to talk about tier three, our early childhood mental health consultation tier. Great, um, and you know, Brandy, as uh, you were talking and you talked about the benefit of kind of partnerships between folks that have been in the classroom and have that early education background and mental health professionals um, that you have both on your team, I was thinking in a way we do something similar. We have, we've paired these two teams that, that bring both of those things. And so our, our technical assistance partners are those um, early education specialists and um, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting for our expulsion prevention system. And so when, um, when Rachel's team um, does an interview with a program and they start to hear things about behavior that's um, clearly atypical um, for the age of a child, when they start to hear things about known trauma that the child has experienced or find out that the child is in foster care or find out that the child is already involved with many different services, that there's special ed involved, there's, there might be a mental health professional out there somewhere, um, and that there's lots of partners that need to be sort of collected to work on behalf of, of a partner, then they, um, they move that case over to, to tier three of our behavior health system, which is Project Play. Um, and that case is assigned for mental health consultation. And again, what that looks like is very much like what, again, Linda and Brandy described. Um, so what happened when Project Play became part of the expulsion prevention system is that our work flip-flopped. So before um, behavior health, about 80% of our cases were programmatic classroom focused consultation. And although we did have child specific cases in those contexts, um, now with behavior health, it's exactly the reverse. About 80, 90% of um, our capacity needs to go to fo focus on um, these child focused cases. And the nature of the work is different in the sense that um, because of the way our system is designed and cases are triaged, cases, every case that comes to us is um, in, inherently complex, um, is high needs, um, is sort of crisis level. Um, and so every, um, every case on a consultant's caseload is likely to be very intense. And so that's been a different kind of experience for us. Um, the way that we provide consultation is in a three month partnership. Um, visits can be two times a week at first and then weekly. Um, and uh, that is a um, quite a short term uh, model if you compare that to other things, other things nationally. Uh, so let's see, Rachel, you're going to talk about um, reach and some of our lessons learned, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about outcomes, I think. Correct. So this is our reach for fiscal year 1920, and it should be important to note that anything year 20 uh, is possibly or likely skewed by COVID. So we served 388 children at 217 centers in 54 of Arkansas's 75 counties. So this is a truly statewide behavior help system. We are able to serve children in every single county if, if need be, and we have the capacity to do so. I'd like to briefly note that if we, over the course of a few years or a year or two, notice that a particular region is either not referring or under referring, 
based on data that we have that would indicate that maybe there is something going on, then we can adjust and do outreach in that area to ensure that they fully understand what behavioral health is and that they have access to it. So with funding, behavior help is duly funded using CCDF federal dollars and Arkansas Better Chance State Preschool dollars. Originally, behave, the behavior help uh, project was funded by reallocating expenses and existing contracts without adding additional funding. Behavior help is built off of existing DCCEC contracts and contracted partners and the professional development infrastructure. However, over the past five years, it has also been supported by the PDG initiatives and project launch with occasional one-time funding from other sources. So when we're looking at barriers, seasonality of referrals has created a little bit of a volume issue. We've noticed that particularly two times of year, we see such strongly such a strong increase in referrals that that is when we have to implement our uh, kind of a step further in our triage system of looking towards severity, funding type, and waitlisting. So how can we best um, prepare for those times of year? Or is, are there other ways that we can address that from maybe a systemic perspective? Arkansas, we had to overcome some historical ways of what we like to call a little bit of old school thinking. When we, uh, when we surveyed providers at the beginning of this initiative, um, the overwhelming majority of them thought it was not only okay to suspend and expel, but they had been doing it and told us as, as such that they had been doing it. And so we have had to overcome this viewpoint of kind of getting rid of children with challenging behaviors to say, no, it, it is best practice to keep them in the setting in, in which they're currently in. Of course, COVID created some unique challenges in that we had to go virtual, which was very difficult for both our TA and uh, mental health consultation providers, but also our early care and education providers. It was a whole new experience for all of us. And while our volume of cases were down, the severity of the cases where we were, we were still receiving was significantly elevated. We saw some of the most severe cases in behavior help history in the year 2020. And the balance between the, the people we partner with um, and child care providers seeing us, the DCCEC, as a regulatory or licensing authority and their partner in behavior help. We don't want them to feel like they're caught in a, in a gotcha, like a gotcha situation. We, we truly are here to help when we have our behavior help hat on. And unless the, there is significant danger or a blatant licensing violation in occurring during our consultation time period or TA time period. The DCCC is not here to to act as kind of this uh, arm of the law against the people who are reaching out for help. And it's been hard to kind of balance and toe that line so that our programs and providers feel comfortable reaching out. And lessons learned. We, we too use the pyramid model here in Arkansas and for, um, for our behavior help system. And we learned that workforce development is a strong need here. We need to work at some of those bottom levels of the pyramid and how we can sustainably keep that workforce development going and increase our focus on trauma-informed care practices at a wider level. Additionally, partnerships are critical. We meet every single Monday to staff these cases every single Monday. And we have for the entirety of almost five years that the system has been running. And that has been crucial to our success, along with partnering with community agencies, child care aware, um, Head Start collaboration offices, and other people in our state who we need to have their buy-in in order to continue to succeed. Um, so I was really struck by how similar some of our outcomes are to what Brandy described. We use, we've even used some of the same tools. Um, so we, we, um, I have to be honest and say that um, we didn't know how it would work with a very short-term consultation model and the kind of severity of cases that we um, that we set ourselves up for with this triage system. But to our great relief, our evaluation results um, suggest that teachers think it's working. So the um, 
the, our findings around um, child behavior are very similar to what Brandy uh, pointed out. I'll just I'll just highlight one other thing, which is that we we use a form called the Sutter Iberg um, form, which is a standardized teacher report measure. And what you see on that graph there is the proportion of kids um, whose scores are clinically elevated at the beginning of consultation and after consultation. And so we certainly do see that most of these children have, are above the cutoff, have clinically elevated concerns that suggest that, that it could warrant support from a mental health professional. So something went right about our triage and we got the kids that we were supposed to, we were supposed to get. And thankfully we see significant reductions both in the frequency of behavior, but one thing we like about this tool is it lets us measure um, the teacher's perception of how much the behavior is a problem for her in the classroom. So sometimes we there are limits to what we can do in three months to, to, to change what's happening, but we can help the teacher shift her perspective of it or her understanding of it so that it becomes um, less of a concern or a problem for her. Um, this is just kind of, again, where kids are. So a lot of the programs that use us are not under the, the Division of Child Care's expulsion rule. They're using us voluntarily. It's open, it's open access. And I was, I was compelled that uh, we see, again, so much of what Brandy has seen. Our expulsion rate for Project Play is 6%. There are other categories that hint at, um, you know, a little bit of a, a, a parent pressure to with draw um, at, at 11 percent, but overall we're able to keep most kids um, in the center where they were. We also use the, the perm like Brandy and are able to show decreased expulsion risk moving forward. And and teacher satisfaction is is high and, and we do have um, repeat users and, and we're happy to help them when they hit a new um, or, or complex uh, situation. And I think we're out of time. So maybe Rachel, if you want to just pick pick a final thought. Uh, definitely buy-in, um, top-down support. Um, that's been one of our number one additional supports that we could get. If teachers feel supported by their administrator who feels supported by the owner or the superintendent or the next person there on up the chain who understands the importance of keeping children in their classroom setting at all costs um, and making this a, a, a great environment for all parties involved, then I think we'll continue to see greater success rates. Um, so we are working on how can we truly change that, uh, that mindset from the classroom all the way on up uh, from there and get that buy-in. And with that, I think we're turning it back to Laura. Thank you so much for all this information. Again, the PowerPoint and the video will be posted uh, mid next week. Um, we just have to go through a five week compliance process so that people can have access to all of these slides. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna let you move over to the funding and resources slide, if that's okay. Um, I wanna make sure that people understand that um, there are allowable uses for your quality dollars that really fall well within the provision um, of supporting each of these two initi um, an IECMHC initiative. So that next slide, Sarah. So remember that with your um, CCDF quality activity dollars, whether it's your general quality activities or your infant toddler set aside, there are categories that really fit very nicely with um, the uh, implementation of a mental health consultation um, network. So um, it can be part of the training professional development system. It can be um, high quality um, initiatives. Um, so again, you can really think about how does this initiative fit in with the expenditure of your quality dollars, as well as other dollars that you can secure in your state. There are some states that um, leverage um, private partnerships to support their mental health consultation networks through grants from a local United Way or from um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So again, be thinking about how you can leverage um, new dollars into your states, um, your quality dollars to implement such an initiative. That next slide, Sarah. So I want to draw your attention um, to the, um, the uh, integrated strategies social emotional wellness page on the ECTAS website. Patty just put it in the um, chat box, just as I was talking. If you go to this website, 
you're going to see not only a resource guide that was co-authored by um, actually people who were on this webinar um, that has really great resources on multiple ways you can integrate social emotional wellness into your early care education system um, for your state, territory, or tribe. So it's going to cover not only the pyramid approach and mental health consultation, but it'll also talk to you about um, initiatives around infant toddler care um, and supporting um, infant toddler services using an infant toddler specialist network. It has a great section on supporting the social emotional wellness of school agers. So it's a great resource. Um, it's also the page where you'll find the webinar and the PowerPoint. So be sure to check that um, page out if you want additional resources. Next slide, Sarah. Um, I wanna just highlight a few of the things that are in the resource guide for you. So in that resource guide, you're gonna have um, uh, the pyramid approach I've talked about, uh, mental health consultation, also implementation considerations, kind of the questions you wanna be asking yourself before you, you know, kind of buy into one approach or another. Um, it's gonna have a great section on the benefits of integrating social emotional wellness strategies. I really find that I direct this section to people who are looking for funding partners. Uh, we've already spelled out the benefits for you. You can just take that and rebrand it and put it in a grant if you want to. So again, we've tried to make this resource guide super helpful to you and um, making sure that you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, as you're beginning to think about initiative. Next slide, Sarah. Also, I think some great things that are in this resource guide are landscape studies. So if you're wondering, I wonder if there's a state near me that's already implementing um, infant or childhood mental health. Maybe they can partner with us. Maybe we can think about um, you know, our borders and how do we support each other with programs that are right on the border of two states. You could go to the landscape study for either the pyramid model or mental health consultation model, and you could see what states are implementing and the stage of their implementation process. So I think that's a really great resource, as well as a bunch of curated resources um, from everybody who's participating on this call. The Center of Excellence has contributed an amazing amount of resources to the resource guide to support um, your practice in implementation. And thank you, Jean, for chatting in the chat box about um, trauma-informed approaches um, in Arkansas. Um, so I really appreciate everybody continue to just chatting in the chat box with these great resources. Next slide, Sarah. So as we are winding down, we have a couple more poll questions for you. The first one is about um, now that we've had this amazing webinar with such great expertise, we're wondering where you are and thinking about um, the implementation of infant early childhood mental health consultation. Um, love to start seeing if you are just exploring and dabbling, or maybe you're fully implementing and you join this to get some ideas about uh, next steps for you or revisions of your process. So there are a lot of you who are already in the implementation stage, um, which is nice because I think getting you all together to talk about what's working and what's not working um, helps you each kind of be involved in a continuous quality improvement cycle for your state, territory, or tribe. And then we have uh, about 17%, we have about four different groups or five different groups who are just starting to explore. So we've helped, we've kind of provided you some information that will um, inform your next steps. And then we have about uh, six different um, states or territories, it's hard to know from this poll, um, who are kind of just engaged in the planning. And if you are engaged in planning, um, we have a lot of um, other people who are willing to support you as mentors. So let us know how we can help with that. And then I think do we have one more poll question, Sarah. Thank you. This next poll question is about your interest in receiving technical assistance or joining a community of practice. So we're interested to see if you would like us to move to another step and engage you in a community of practice around this topic, um, or if you're interested in receiving technical assistance. So yeah, so um, no surprise, everyone's always interested in support and help. And I do wanna make sure that you know that there is help out there. So, um, so let me go to the next slide, Sarah. So first of all, you can, you can really reach out to many different people to get support. 
Um, if you know who your um, state system specialist is um, for your um, for your region, you can reach out to your state system specialist. Um, if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about around a state system specialist, your state administrator can help you kind of access your state system specialist or your state administrator would actually access them for you to, to ask for um, federal technical assistance in this area. But you can also just chat in the chat box and you can also just shoot uh, me or Patty or Jean an email at the Quality Assurance Center at ECETTA info and we will um, hear your request and then we will kind of nurture your request through the protocols um, that are required to get uh, regional approval and state approval um, and we'll work closely with your state system specialist. You can also reach out to the Center of Excellence. They are super happy to support you in moving you along. And there is um, how you access the Center of Excellence. Um, and they have, uh, again, more resources than we could ever explore on this webinar. Um, and just everyone there really focused on making sure that you are thoughtful in your implementation um, and that you're successful in your implementation. And then um, my friend Brandy is on, Mandy is on the phone from um, PDG Technical Assistance. If you're, call, if you're on the line um, and you are a PDG state, there you go. You have someone just waiting to support you. Um, this is Mandy uh, who supports the PDG Technical Assistance. And Mandy, we have one minute, but I thought it'd be great just for people to know who you are and, and have you talk about your resources. Yeah, thanks. I think I can do it in less than a minute. So PDG came up in both the state presentations, and I think it's because it, in, uh, mental health consultation is such a great example of cross-system collaborative efforts to improve the lives of kids and their families. And so if you're a PDG state and you want to reach out, our email address is pdgta at sri.com, um, and we'd be happy to connect you with the center of excellence or with the early childhood quality assurance center or help you connect with other pdg states as well ah thank you so much so yeah so remember there are a lot of us out there um, who are willing to help you and whoever you reach out to if they're not the right fit they'll make sure that they transfer you to somebody else who can help so um, we're a, a, a large robust ta team that supports each other and our goal, only goal, is to make sure that you're successful in supporting um, the social emotional wellness of young children and, and the health and safety of young children. So, um, and Richard put in the chat box, thank you, Richard. If you're not a PDG state, you can still get help in this area. Absolutely. From any of um, our national centers, we're happy to support you in these efforts um, and make sure that you have a successful implementation um, plan, and then that you meet your goals in implementation. So I want to thank everyone for hanging in there for the call. Um, we really appreciate your time. Look for um, these to be posted mid next week. If you have any other questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us at um, either PDG or ECQA, the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance, or through the Center of Excellence. Thanks everybody and have a wonderful afternoon.